In the time before there were humans, the myth period, the world was occupied by the Nipicus, who looked and lived like humans. Their names were those of what was in nature. These Nipicus all had different amounts of power. The Nipicus had always known that the humans would come upon the world one day and lay claim to it. The spirits would then have to step aside and quit living like humans. While they held domination over the world, the Nipicus killed various giants and monsters that would jeopardize the humans. All the Nipicus had power, the amount varying from one to another. On the day that the humans were to arrive, the chief of the spirits called a council. The chief asked each spirit in what way it would help the people. Each decided and told the chief what power it would give to the people. Each then sang the power song, which would also be given to the humans for the purpose of calling the spirit for aid. Rabbit could not make up his mind, and as the humans arrived in their canoes, he jumped into a clump of small trees. He therefore gives no power, and also lives in a thicket. None of the Nipicas were too happy about relinquishing the world to the humans, and giving up living like people, especially the spirits whose names were those of the class of four-legged land animals with claws. These spirits with their leader, Otter, called a council and decided to challenge the humans to a series of games, contests, the ultimate winner of which would take possession of the world. Each game of the series was to be alternately chosen by the humans and the spirits. Moreover, since each game would match a human against a spirit, each would make a side bet, a wager in addition to the main stakes of the series of his life, the loser foregoing his. The spirits, because they felt sure they would win, planned in this way to do away with the humans, one by one, and thus maintain their position in the world. The humans held a council and agreed to the terms. The chief of the humans announced this fact to the spirits and added that there would be no backing out and that the games must be played fairly. The spirits agreed. The game started and the spirits won as they anticipated. The humans lost in numbers. Their chief became saddened by the plight of his people and held councils from time to time, advising there had to be a way for them to win since the Great Spirit had determined that they would take possession of the world. Different people thought of games suggested to them in council and volunteered to represent the humans in that game. If it was determined that the person had a chance to win the games was tried. However, as events progressed, the spirits continued to win. In one village, an orphan lived with his grandmother. He was told of the games and how the humans were losing. 
he tried to figure a way for the humans to win. One evening, he was sent out for a basket of water. He threw a stick into the stream and watched it as it floated past. To him, the stick symbolized the lives of the people that were floating by him. He thought that the water would continue to flow until the end of the world and that the stick floated on top of the water and therefore there should be a way to save the people. He thought of the place to which the water flowed and lost his senses and the stick floated away. His thoughts returned to the stick on the way home and he decided to return to the stream and look for the stick and the salvation of the people. Dog went to the boy and told him he was one of the clawed class of spirits, but was unhappy because Otter had given him spoiled food, so he would help the boy. This is the legend of how the orphan helped the humans win the right to live on Earth. The game was played and the humans won. The spirits gave full rights to the humans on Earth. Dog was sent to live with the humans and was banished from his spirit group. He was warned that if he ever left the company of the humans, he would be punished. Descendant to Flatbow Kootenays of Lower Division, Robert Joseph Louis was born in 1950. His customary name of Yaminkin, referring to a species of bluebird, was given to him by his grandfather, Louis Ernest. Robert was born into the culture of the Flatbow Kootenays and has lived his whole life within his ancestral traditional territory. Born on the Kootenay wetlands, he was delivered by a Yakanuki midwife, and as is the tradition, Family, friends, and relatives gathered nearby to hear the news of his birth. The day Robert was born, his maternal grandmother told the family the baby was coming to live with her. From the day of his birth to her passing in the late 1960s, Robert lived with his grandmother in the ancestral traditional homeland territory, receiving her gifts of guidance and wisdom of the old ways. Through listening and participating with grandmother's song at sunrise and sunset, by traveling in a canoe through the Kootenai Basin, and by hearing his grandmother's words, Robert was mentored into his people's oral history and traditions. Grandmother Marion Ernest Goodman lived from the early 1900s to 1966. Living in the wetlands of Lower Kootenai Reserve, she was the last person to travel daily in the Kootenai canoe, and she spoke only the Tanakha language. Each evening, the day would end with one of the legends of the ancestors. These legends have been handed down through tens of thousands of years of oral tradition. Many of the legends are entrenched in the geography of the territory inhabited by the Flatbow Kootenai since the beginning of creation. Robert was always by his grandmother's side during family visits, encampments, gatherings, festivals, and ritual ceremonies. These experiences exposed him to the collective wisdom of the Lower Division Kootenai people. Through these strong traditional teachings, Robert came to know himself, his people, their history, their systems of beliefs, ways of life, the oral teachings, motif folklore themed tale stories, and the geographical ancestral homeland settings. Often, his grandparents and river neighbors quizzed Robert before bedding down for the night, an expression of honoring their ancestors, their sacrifices, their practices in keeping their prayers and dreams alive through generational retention of the knowledge. Many events of communal living formed Robert. The elders who mentored him along with his grandmother and mother told him, accept your particular life, the whole of it, then celebrate it with joy, your connection to it, give back, return through sharing, all that has been given to you. Through grandmother's oral teachings, Robert gained a living experience of her ways, which were based on the foundational framework of ancestral Aboriginal encampment. It was here that as a young child, he gained the understanding of the ancestors of yesteryear, lower division Flatbow Kootenai people, who share a deep and abiding relationship to their home. 
the Kootenai River and Kootenai-like territory. As Robert stated, it was a privilege for me to learn how my ancestors' early Aboriginal encampments mini-community reflected a natural group of families, friends, relatives, people living in the same place under the same laws. This composition was a community mirror of the earliest expression of human culture. In some places, the life lessons contain unbroken lines of ancestry originating from the beginning of time. In coming to know himself and as a continuing student of his grandmother's oral teachings, Robert sensed that their encampment mini-community itself was a story, a collection of individual oral motif folklore that unfolds through the lives of the ancestral people and on to present day. The motif folklore stories become an animate entity vitalized through the special attention given it by its storytellers and listeners. And when the story's message is fully received, it induces a powerful understanding that becomes a real teaching. Origin stories, the lived stories of place, kinship, and environmental knowledge, form the foundation of the expression of ancestral lower division Kootenai Flatbow people. It is this version of Aboriginal science that arises from encampment mini communities. Nature was the frame of reality that formed many learning experiences. Flatbow Kootenai people connect themselves to the plants, animals, waters, mountains, sun, moon, stars, and planets of their world. The geographical and structural orientation of the ancestors' archaeology sites to their natural place and the collectively held traditional knowledge reflect a communal consciousness that includes the supernatural world in an intimate and reciprocal relationship. Okay, today I'm going to be talking about the uh, legend of the both mountains, Awaik and Saik. Awaik is the mountains where we gain the rights to come on earth through the gambling rights. Awake and Saik, they talk to each other. Awake, you can see the picture of the uh, otter and the, the kick stick and sturgeon nose canoe. Saik also produces the image of the sturgeon nose canoe. I was told through my mentors, my elders, that the difference between Awake and Saik. Awake is the old fashioned when they're establishing the canoe and it's through the white pine. Then we use animal hides such as moose and elk for building the canoe. Saik is the new version. It's an evolution of the mountain. Saik is the one that is today's virgin material such as the canvas. It's a continuing flux and motion in, that's taking place all the time. Awake is the one that also produces the old, the old way of producing the canoe. So one is the white pine and the other one is cannabis. Awake is the one that uh, also produces our spiritual beliefs and also used for an adoption and it came to a boy who was uh, an orphan and uh, the orphan was adopted through an elder. I wasn't an orphan, but that also produced a story where my grandmother came and took me since I was a young child. She taught me, and the two grandparents was there to guide the young orphan child. We are gamblers. Since we're gamblers, we witnessed where all materials been for wagering but that was for uh, charitable purposes. We looked at the single parents and then all the uh, waiters. When we wager something, we gave to each, especially now, at the beginning of late fall, and almost another month, it'll be in winter, we used to give our proceeds to the single parents so they won't go hungry. Telling the story about the kidneys, how unique we are, and then when we came to Earth, the gambling story, through Awaik, it talks about the coming of a unique people who possesses three sources of languages. Our language is also was unique compared to any of the First Nations in the world. We're an isolate. The Sergeant Canoe 
represents our culture, traditions, customary ways, and our true identity and the language, those three sources of languages. When I was growing up, there's that valley which is presently known as Corn Creek. That was a weather prediction forecasting of weather uh, coming, whether it's going to be snow, rain, wind, and that between that, those two valleys, we can see any storm coming in. And it's usually a 35 minute time period once we see the from uh, between those 200 uh, trenches is we know that it's going to rain or snow. And then we drop everything and we go make a shelter and then that's where we used to stay till the weather, the weather blows over. Then we continue our daily task. The sign language and eye language also comes with uh, the bird calls. The bird calls is uh, also our sources of uh, communication. The animals, uh, the whistling of the animals, which is the elk, and the deer also a source of communication. Then there's the uh, ducks and the birds, especially the uh, red-winged blackbirds. They're also our sources of communication. The picture crafts, we call it record holder, because my grandmother and my late mother, Isabel, they also said that when she was grown up, the picture craft, it tells a story about a dream someone had. And you look at the, the picture crafts, Two years before she passed away, she told me the, the whole story about each uh, pictograph, what it means, what it really means. She says that the pictographs, it, it's, a, it's a prediction for what's going to happen next or anything that's going to happen. The, uh, the, uh, the person who, who had the dream goes there and puts it up and it's, uh, it's uh, forecasting what's going to happen. The astronomy is what star bonds with the Flabo Kudnis. The, the astronomy, there are certain stars like the North Dipper and the Small Dipper and how it connects and how we form our bondage if you ever lost. The stars, they have a big role. They have a big role in our uh, beliefs and the galaxy is uh, the one that uh, really fascinates me because my ancestors told me that I have no reason to disbelieve them is that there, there is another planet out there long before we were ever here as human being. The, the story that goes back to the beginning of time when there was no human being. There weren't people yet. We were part of the spirits. Then the supernatural gave us this human being in human form. The horse plays a big part. The fun of the horse because it, uh, it was my grandma's idea. She says that when the horse comes galloping, it has a lot of uh, meaning behind it. Even today, there's horse racing. The horse knew who was going to win. This is why it was it, it, it was galloping. After the asteroid hit the uh, the, the Earth, well, that's when it exploded. And uh, there was only all the animals and the spirit left behind. They were living inside here, and uh, there were gamblers uh, who would gain rights to come on Earth. The humans, and when they won, to come on Earth, they came on with this uh, the canoe, and uh, with the canoe, is that it's uh, it was a prediction of coming of the unique human beings. Awake and sake was there, and we were inside the uh, the mountain. We were going to be challenging the spirits to, who uh, who will come to. Uh, Earth and who's going to win the rights to come on Earth. This is where the orphan boy was told how to beat the otter to its game and the, the boy obeyed the orders and this is the way we came. 
through use the, today's version of the Summit Creek that comes into the uh, comes in, flows into the valley. There was a great uh, game happening. Is that uh, the boy kept on going down to get some water for the night, and then he heard that he heard that story, the great stick game. Through the stories, we were losing every game there was. And then when Pete Moss, he kept on watching his boy. And he finally asked this boy in a deep throat, what is it he's thinking about? Because the boy was sitting on the side of the uh, river bank, which is the Summit Creek. And then the boy finally told him he wished he could help. He, could, he wished he could help. Is uh, the humans to win the rights on earth. So the peat moss said, Allah, here's how I can help you. Get a, a flute, drill seven holes. On the seventh hole, the dog said, you touch my ear. Was And that's his favorite game. The otter was going in and out of the seven holes. And on the, seventh hole, the sixth hole, when he came out, the boy touched his ear. And then the order went in and never came back out. That's how uh, that's how the game what was which was won. The legend of the moose, and that's the beginning of the stories of down the lake uh, with the rock sculptures. At the beginning of time, when there was no other sources of game, we used to go down to the prairies, and then we were outnumbered by our enemies over the hump, they call it the continental divide. And the spirits took pity on us. According to my mentors, my grandmother and all others who mentored me, laying in bed and listening to their stories of the stories that's been handed down one generation to the next. Since we're being uh, outnumbered and then the spirits felt sorry for us, and he told the shamans to gather up the people and go down to the present location of the day is Lockhart Beach. Back then, there was no roads. They were all used canoes. And then the spirits told the shaman that it's going to show us something that's going to be equivalent, equivalent to a buffalo. And there was a lot of skepticism about this. And then the ones who believed went to, uh, took their canoe and paddled down to Lockhart along the edges. There was a big rumbling in the mountains, and it slowly became an image of uh, an animal. And then by the time when the image came through, uh, you can physically see the animal, and it became be the moose. And sure enough, what the creator said, it's going to be equivalent to the uh, buffalo. And then you look at the bull, bull moose, it's got a bell equivalent to the buffalo. And the same, same hump on the back, and same, almost the same size moose and the buffalo. Yo, kick him, the frog. And the Onik is the landlocked salmon, and the Smokse is the one that crawled about and gave the layout of the territory. Now, Smokse is a special water creature that the Yakanuki people tell about. He is a very, very big creature, and everyone knows that he is loving, kind, and generous. A long, long time ago, before there were people living on the land, Nashmuksi lived up north near Columbia Lake, British Columbia. One day, Nashmuksi was given a special job. To do the job, he started a long journey. When he left, he crawled up on his hands and feet and the water from the Columbia Lake filled up his path. This created a river now known as the Kootenai River. Meanwhile, back home, there was a misunderstanding between Muskrat and Woodpecker and his brothers. Out of this misunderstanding, Woodpecker and his brothers became jealous of Nashmuksi because he had a special job to do. Nashmuksi knew that special people were going to come and live on this land near the Kootenai River. They would be the Tnakha people, brothers and sisters of the Yakanuki people. His special job was to get the land ready for the coming people. Nashmuksi crawled and crawled along, 
his sweat flew off and formed lakes along the way. He was thinking of these new people coming and was so generous that he left pieces of himself along the way. These pieces of Nashmuxi formed interesting land along the way. Meanwhile, back at Columbia Lake, Skin Coots, the coyote, told Woodpecker and his brothers that they should follow Nashmuxi and try to catch up with him. They decided to do this. Skin Coots was a troublemaker, so he also went to Nashmuxi and told him that Woodpecker and his brothers were chasing him. Nashmuxi felt sad when he heard the news. He stood up and cried great big tears that splashed far and wide. Most of the tears formed Ponderé Lake. One large tear flew up north and created Summit Lake in British Columbia. Skin Coots then told Woodpecker and his gang that he knew where Nashmuxi was. They talked and talked and finally made a deal for the information. As this was going on, Nashmuxi kept crawling along. He knew he was doing good things for the people that were coming. He wiggled and squirmed and managed to push himself through the narrow opening of Kootenai Falls. As he traveled along, he left pieces of himself as gifts for the people. These gifts formed interesting land. His wiggles and squiggles formed the Kootenai River into many curves and bends. Woodpecker and his gang finally got to Kootenai Falls and started to set a trap for Nashmuxi. Skin Coots watched with a smile as he knew it was all for nothing as Nashmuxi had already gone through this area and was long gone. Nashmuxi continued to share parts of himself with the people that were coming. He worked fast as he knew that he was being chased. Part of his nose was tossed off and formed the area now known as Port Hill, Idaho. Nashmuxi had one hip left and he tossed it near where Wendell, British Columbia is today. This is why the river bends in the shape of a hip in that area. Suddenly, Nashmuxi looked behind him and saw Woodpecker and his gang not far behind him. He knew he had to hurry to finish what he was doing, so he stood up as tall as he could and pushed himself forward into the land. The water rushed in and formed Kootenai Lake. Woodpecker and his gang tried to find Nashmuxi, but he was safe under the water. They looked and looked but could not find him, so they decided to go back home. Nashmuxi was then safe to live in Kootenai Lake. Sometimes you can see his outline at the water's edge as he lies around enjoying the sun. The Yakanuki people always tell their children about him and have never forgotten him. Then there's the legend of grizzly and the coyote. The story behind this is to produce no teasing in our culture, no bullying. Our eyes were all equal. The story about the grizzly was on the east side walking along and coyote was on the west side. And then he had sharp eyes and then he seen, he seen uh, the grizzly the grizzly was uh, grazing about, and uh, the, along with the coyote there was a bunch of other animals. There was uh, the chipmunk, the porcupine, mule deer, wolverine. We were all there. The other animals told coyote, "Don't, don't, don't do it," because they knew what coyote was going to be, was about to do. So coyote hauled across the lake start calling uh, names to grizzly, called them small eyes and uh, sleepy eyes. And grizzly, his patience ran short, and then he looked, mule they all, they all scattered and left, and Kite was by himself, and he started to uh, get excited. And the grizzly took six pushes, and they came across the other side. Coyote had, uh, he was also known as a trickster and then he had powers, natural powers, and he cast a spell to the grizzly bear and uh, when grizzly bear, he waited just enough time for grizzly to come out from the water, he cast a spell and then th this is why the grizzly bear is all stoned and then Coyote told uh, the grizzly that he, sc he scared him stone deaf and he started laughing, and he wasn't through then. So he went across east side, each shore of the Kuna Lake, and then it just so happened, he glanced over, and he saw frog Yo Kikam. Yo Kikam had a bow. He was testing it out because Yo Kikam was going to give that as a gift to the Kunis. This is where we're called flood bows, flood bow Kunis, because they. 
the weapon was flat compared to other First Nations. What happened is that coyote snuck up onto Yo Kikam, the frog, and then he hollered from behind and he clapped his hand and he hollered, frog, Yo Kikam jumped and he accidentally released uh, the bow and it went down south and his arrow was in Elma, Montana. That's where it landed. In the meantime, the frog was so scared and he tried to leap over a mountain and then he couldn't do it. And the coyote started laughing and told Yo Kikam, the frog, that you don't leave your friends high and dry. Because if you look at the Yo Kikam, the frog, you can see the, the frog getting caught right at the top. So coyote started laughing and then he went down, downstream. That's when he saw another species along the edge. Then he looked at otter, and then he looked at otter, and then he says that he, he's concerned because it's, he, had, he had such a beautiful time scaring Yo Kikam, the bullfrog, and the casting spell over the, the grizzly bear. My grandparents, when I was seven years old, when we were traveling our expeditions up towards Argenta, they introduced me to the chiefs. There are seven chiefs in our culture to represent our beliefs. And there's other rock sculptors, I call it. And there's one about Pinocchio. The Pinocchio is uh, one you can see. It's a cross uh, between the glass house and Cuscanuk better view from the glass house if you're looking towards the west, southwest. That's our version of the, uh, the story. At that age, I didn't know there was another story about Pinocchio, but in our culture, the story goes, if you tell a lie, your nose will grow, and uh, pretty soon it'll be long enough people will not trust you, they will not respect you, they will not adore you, because they just don't... Uh, uh, trust you because uh, the know your nose will tell everything about yourself. When you're going down the lake, you can look at uh, Pinocchio. You can actually see the nose grown. I'm going now. I'm going to go to the chiefs. There's the seven chiefs. Each have a responsibility. They're, they were each summoned by the higher beings, super beings, to this is their role down the lake. The chiefs will also look after your well-being while in the waters of the Kootenai Lake. Mainly, the legends was established way before were ever been human beings. The Kootenais or the floodbows and the Arrow Lakes, upper and lower Arrow Lakes, this uh, share a special bondage because of the the floodbow and the Okikam's gift. Yo Kekam is in our culture is called the cultural hero because he is the one who gave us the weaponry. We cannot be compared to any other First Nations on earth. We will have our separate dialect language we, and then we were going to have a separate uh, the canoe itself. Uh, everything was being uh, g given to us while we were, when we won the rights here. But the, the old saying goes, as my grandmother would say, we have to be careful with when we, what we wish for because coyote is a trickster and he'll give you something worth than you can bargain for. And then he's never to be trusted. And no matter how crazy he gets, we all, we count on him because he's the caretaker of the lakeshore. Sometimes you see a coyote run, run along the river bank or the lake banks, the shores, and he's inspecting the water to make sure there's the water quality is good. I was a little cooking and I saw me to go to the cook and cup of cups and it was a little bit of a monotla. It was a little cooking and it was a little bit of a cooking and it was a little bit of a cup of cups and it was a little bit of a cup of cups. Sukal kokamik, kau sabtu dah nak watek, kau tak timbul, 
Gutun Wakaken go to Kapamanosa Kapakapsen Now San Mietke Aksan Miet Gusel Kneswitik Kapsen Kapsen Gusel Kaki Gusel then what I can know the Kaskanach Watasa Kasatel Kaskanach Watas Kapi Kapsen.